welcome to church. Welcome. The presence of God is so strong in here today. Uh, I feel like the Holy Spirit is really moving and ministering into our lives today. Some days feel you feel it. You just go, God's moving in it today. And I love that. I love it when it's just not about just singing songs. It's about ministry. It's about the Lord. It's His Spirit here. And so thank you for being a church that honors the Holy Spirit that presses in to worship, a church that prays and a church that believes by faith that people are being healed and set free. I thank you for a prayer team that just stands in the gap and just prays over every person that comes in. I thank you for having faith to pray today. Come on, church, if you just love what Jesus does. Amen. So good. Hey, if you're a guest today, I want to say welcome to church. We're so glad you're here. Uh, all of us are glad you're here. We just pray for you to just feel the presence of God. And I hope this message today helps you. We're in a series today called Marriage Tune-Up. And so we're just helping marriages run smoothly. Uh, just like your car, your car needs a tune-up. Every marriage needs a tune-up. And if you're not married and you're like, how does it apply to me? Today's topic absolutely will apply to every person in the room today. So everybody's going to need a pen, something to write on today. I have some points that you're going to want to take home. It's going to be great today. Let me tell you what I'm going to talk about, and then I'll give you a title to my sermon. Let me tell you what I'm going to talk about first. The problem, I mean, the, the what, problems, I'm going to talk about problems. Uh, what we're going to talk about is resolving problems. Uh, every marriage has conflicts. That doesn't mean you have a bad marriage if you have conflicts. Now, you're going to have a bad marriage if you don't learn to resolve conflicts. And that's what we're going to talk about today. My sermon title, I think it's kind of funny. Um, and so I, I like funny titles sometimes, but I bet you won't forget this title. You'll be talking about it this week. You're going to be at work and you're going to tell somebody, my pastor said this and, and you're going to like it. So my sermon title today is Fight Me. <laughs> Have you ever wanted to say that? Fight me. Come on, look at somebody and say, fight me. Fight me. Come on, fight me. Fight me. Oh, yeah. So before I preach about fight me, I'm going to pray. Uh, we need God to help us. Father, thank you for this day. Uh, we just love you, Lord. We thank you for your presence that's here. Uh, Father, I know that in households, in marriages, there are conflicts. And some people are in the middle of one right now, and even just bringing this up creates a little bit of, of une uneasiness. Uh, I know there are people that are in a happy spot in their marriage, and unfortunately there will be a day we have conflict, and so we need to know how to handle it. Lord, I pray for every marriage in the house, uh, that you would give it peace in it today, peace over the marriages. Help us to learn how to have a good fight, Lord. How to solve the conflicts, how to solve the problems. We love you, Lord. I thank you for every person who's here. Lord, use this message to speak to every person. Uh, let us all walk out with something that we can use and grow closer to you in. In Jesus' name. Can I get a really good amen? Amen. 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 Marriage creates conflict. Uh, roommates. If you're in college and you have a roommate, there's going to be conflict. Coworkers. You're going to have conflict. Anywhere you put people together, working together, living together, conflict. Especially in marriage. Marriage just is about two lives coming together. The Bible says that we are to become one. Well, that becoming one is not always easy. We have different backgrounds. Uh, you were raised by you know, parents that maybe had different uh, ways of parenting. Uh, we have potentially different social circles that we grew up in. Maybe one of you grew up in church and one of you didn't. Uh, maybe uh, there was some sort of uh, way that you were raised that, uh, you know, like scarred your past. And we bring all of that into the marriage. And so there are going to be conflicts. And not to mention our selfish nature, our sinful nature, because we bring that into the marriage as well. And so you add all that together, put that in one house under one roof, and we you know, have a wedding, and we pat you on the back and say, go get it, you know, and before you know it, you're living at home trying to figure it all out. And so today I'm here to help you figure some of it out, because fighting isn't only inevitable, 
church, a good fight is necessary for our relationship to grow closer. And let me tell you why. Because unresolved conflict is fertile soil for smaller problems to become bigger problems. Unresolved conflicts, unresolved problems become walls that grow between us. Unresolved conflict and problems that we don't solve are a breeding ground for bitterness to come in that can damage our relationships. And so we don't want to leave things unresolved. We want to have a good fight. A good fight to solve the problem. So I'm going to need a little help today. I need a married couple. I need someone, a couple that's been married for more than 15 years. Do I have any volunteers? More than 15? Yeah, well, um, she volunteered you, but yeah, oh, there you go. <laughs> The slap brought you in, so go ahead and come on up. Um, we need you up here. Awesome. Um, conflict. I've, we've already got conflict. That was the best picture I've ever seen. Like, that was so perfect. If everyone could have seen what I just saw. Need volunteers? She raised her hand. He didn't. She slapped him, and here they come. Awesome. Sermon done right there. He didn't know how long we've been married. More troubles, more troubles. Um, I'm going to ask her a couple questions, and you just, just nod away. How long have you been married? 16 years. 16 years. All right, so you qualify. Oh, let's give names. Let me know who you are. I'm Samantha. Matthew Warner. Matthew Warner. Okay, awesome. How long have you been at our church? Almost 12 years. 12 years. Yeah. Oh, man. All right, so awesome. All right, so we're going to illustrate a little bit about how problems kind of get between us and kind of what happens. So I need you to come over here on this side of the table and stand right here. And I'm going to bring a problem to the table. Now, a problem is just a small problem right now. Small box, small problem, nothing major yet. The problem is, is that some people ignore problems. And so let's just hypothetically say you're the one that loves to ignore problems. You hate conflict. Like, I hate conflict. I get it. Honestly, everyone should hate conflict. Like, if you like conflict, you're weird, okay? So, like, who wants to be in fights? I don't know who that is. So we, we don't want to be in fights. But let's just say you're a little more extreme and you like to ignore the conflicts. What happens when we ignore a conflict is we don't deal with it, and so it stays, but it doesn't just stay, it grows. Problems never stay just a problem if we don't deal with it. So when we have a problem that we don't deal with, then the problem gets a little bit bigger, and now we're trying to carry this problem that is growing. So one of the problems that we have is we ignore the problems. Uh, some people think it's more loving to ignore the problems. They're like, I don't want to bring it up. I, I just want to be full of grace and love. And let me tell you something. That ignoring a problem and not solving a problem is not love. That's enablement. If there's a real issue in your marriage, if there's a problem that's going on, and you are just ignoring it, you are not helping your marriage, you're hurting your marriage because problems never stay the same. They just continue to grow. And so some people want to be, they want to be peacekeepers. You know what a peacekeeper is? A peacekeeper is where we avoid the problem and hope it goes away. I'm that kind of person. I like to avoid stuff. I don't like it. Listen, occasionally, rarely, we've been married 30 years, twice. I've been frustrated with Harriet. Thank you over there. <laughs> frustrated with Harriet about something. Anytime I'm there, I, my stomach, I feel it inside. I'm like, oh, I don't want to bring it up. I don't want to talk about it. I don't want to have any kind of additional conflict. I'm hoping that she just goes and spends time with Jesus and he tells her about it and then and it's all good. <laughs> How many of you people have ever prayed, Lord, Tell my spouse what's wrong with them and fix them. All right. Okay. All right. So we've all done that. And sometimes it works. So like, yes, Lord. So, um, but most of the time the Lord says, awesome. Uh, you need to have a little fight. Not about a fight, but about solving a problem. And we need to solve the problem. So most of us want to ignore it. 
The other problem we have, I'm not saying this is you at all, and I'm not saying that is you, just illustration, all right? Um, sometimes rather than solve the problem, we want to fight each other. And so this problem makes me mad, and so I'm going to get mad at you, and we're going to have a fight. We're going to say things that we're going to regret. We're going to tear each other down, and I'm going to win, and you're going to see that you were wrong, and, and we end up hurting each other in this. And so instead of fixing a problem, we now multiply the problem. Because now we're having to deal with all the things we said. So now it's not just this, it's the thing you said about me. It's the thing you said about the way I do this. And now it's personalized. And anytime we personalize the problem, then we grow it and multiply it. And so what we want to learn to do is to solve problems. And so when I say fight me, I'm not saying we're going to engage in a battle here. I'm saying we're both going to come to the table to solve a problem. I need one person to step up and say, I have an issue in my life. I have an issue with something with you or between us. And I need you to come to the other side of the table and help me work on it. Let me give you a definition of fight me. Look at this right here. Look at this first definition right here. A good fight means to solve a problem no matter how hard it is. A good fight. Not, not just a fight fight. Like, I don't, I'm not trying to, you know, release you all to go fight with each other. A good fight. A fight that comes to the table and understands some of the rules in, of engagement and how we can solve problems. A good fight does that. Here's what I'm asking you to do, because it takes two people to have a good fight. Look at this definition here. Fight me is a call to engage in a conflict to solve a problem so that we can have a better relationship. Fight me is a call to engage. There's a problem. I need you and I to come and sit and talk about it. We're not going to ignore it, and we're not going to fight each other. We're going to engage in a problem so that we can deal with it, so that it doesn't become a barrier to us, or it doesn't grow it or multiply it. We have to solve the problem. Amen to that? All right, so put your boxes down. And I want you to come to the problem. Now, while it's a small problem, it's a lot easier to deal with little problems. All right, so I want you just to open the box together. <coughs> Look in there. There's a gift for you. Oh, aren't you glad you came now? Uh, see, <laughs> there's a $10 gift card in there. And here's the beauty of it. When you come together and solve the little problems... Then you get to go out for coffee and look at each other and say, Honey, I love you. We're closer than we've ever been. The problems in our life are much you know, behind us now. We get to solve them. And let's go enjoy a coffee together. Isn't that great? Awesome, awesome. That's what it's all about. We're going to solve the problems together while they're small. Can I get an amen, church? Amen. amen. Thank you. Thank you to the Warners. We love you guys. You're awesome. You're awesome. Nothing like a little illustration to help us see what we want to do. A good fight, church, a good fight is the way to a great marriage. Because if we don't have a good fight, we keep the problems and they continue to grow. They continue to multiply. So what is fighting? Let me tell you what fighting is not first, because like, we need to define what we're not doing. What we're not doing is having physical fights. All right? uh, we're not going to be abusive in any way. We're not going to use intimidation in any way. Uh, there's no kind of abuse that we are talking about whatsoever. If you're in an abusive situation, we need you to get help. We don't expect anyone to endure abuse. Amen? I'm also not talking about nagging. I'm not talking about every little nitpicky thing in your life. I'm not talking about you looking at your spouse through the lens of everything is wrong with them and I'm going to nag at them and fix it. Let me tell you what nagging is. You know what nagging is? Nagging is passive aggressive communication that equals fingernails on a chalkboard. It kills everybody. And it doesn't solve any problems. If you have a real problem, don't nag. You know what nagging does to the other person? It puts resistance up. You'll never solve a real problem. So if you have a real problem, instead of nagging about it, you bring the box to the table. 
and you say, I want to talk about this box. I want to talk about what's going on. I want to talk about the issues that are happening. And so that's what we're talking about. We're not talking about nagging. We're not talking about fist fights, uh, any kind of abuse. Let's go to the book of Ephesians for just a moment and let's get a little context for a good fight. A good fight. It says, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. So what this means is that when there is a conflict, when there's something that is brewing over a problem, have you ever been there when you, there's a problem and you start to feel it brewing? You feel it starting to stir in your life. You feel it starting to cause you to kind of feel something inside. That's what this is talking about. When there's a problem brewing, it's saying, don't let the sun go down on that problem. In other words, don't let that anger brew. It's time to solve the problem. Don't let that continue. Don't let the problem continue to exist. Don't let the sun go down and solve the problems in your life. Solve the problem. Solve it. Don't let the sun go down. I think sometimes people have read this verse and they think that it means that, you know, they should never go to bed if we're in an argument. Well, some of you would be sleep deprived for too long. But that's not what it's talking about. It's not saying, you know, to never get any sleep. Sometimes the best thing you can do is get a little sleep when you're a little frustrated and come back at the, at the conflict with fresh, you know, fresh eyes. What it's saying is, is don't let the sun go down. In other words, don't let the problem persist. Don't let it continue. Solve the problem. Engage. It's, it's, it's a call to come fight me. Not fight me, but fight the problem. Solve the problems in your life. And the reason why, the reason we don't want to let, the, let the, the anger or the problem continue, it says it gives the devil a foothold. What happens to every couple is when you don't solve the problem, the enemy begins to work within that unresolved conflict. And he begins to, to plant seeds in your mind, seeds of frustration. He plants seeds of things like, well, this isn't working for us. And, and what happens is little videos start playing or little tapes in your head start playing about how you don't like your spouse anymore and how it would be better if we weren't together anymore. And these thoughts start playing in your mind. You start thinking things like, well, you know, I wish I wasn't married anymore. That's what happens with unresolved conflict. The enemy finds a foothold and begins to make what was small into something greater. Allowing a problem to fester only creates greater frustration. That's why the Bible says in Ephesians 4, verse 15, it says, speaking the truth in love. Speaking the truth in love. We are to grow up in every way unto Him who is the head unto Christ. Speaking the truth in love. Rather than allowing a difficult problem, we speak the truth. We say, honey, we need to have a talk. We need to sit down. We need to chat about this. We do it in truth, because the truth is we have a problem. Ignoring it won't fix it. The truth is, honey, we need to talk about this. But how do we do it? We do it in love. We do it with compassion. We do it with a heart to, to solve the problem together in a loving way. Sometimes it takes loving confrontation to bring healthy change and growth in your marriage. I hate confrontation, but I do know without it, sometimes there's no change. The marriage won't grow healthy. I want to encourage you if you're married. I know some of this is a little uncomfortable, to be honest. I know that in the middle of a... Uh, sermon where we're talking about marriage conflict some of you immediately jump into a conflict that you're having right now and in some ways it's uncomfortable and sometimes uncomfortable is healthy because it causes us to to deal with the things in our life and so if you feel a little uncomfortable I'm not trying to make you uncomfortable I just believe that sometimes the message begins to work on us on the inside and that's a healthy thing but I want to encourage you to to not cower away from difficult conversations in your household. Don't cower away from those things. Don't back away. Even if it makes you uncomfortable at home, it's better to deal with it than to let the problems exist and persist because they don't just go away. Don't cower away. Have the hard conversations. And I'll give you some examples of maybe some hard conversations. And, and I know that I'm not talking to anyone here. This is going to be for someone that listens online and they're, that's for them. So all of you are fine. If you're listening online right now, this is for you. Um, 
But here's a couple things. You know, like, honey, I think you're playing video games way too much. Don't look at your spouse. <laughs> honey, you're neglecting the children. Honey, you're neglecting me. Honey, you've started to drink more than I'm comfortable with. Honey, I like the word honey, by the way. <laughs> Every hard conversation is to start with honey. It's sweet. Honey, you're spending too much money. Honey, your, your attention has been too much on that other person and I'm beginning to feel a little jealous. The hard conversations. In other words, deal with the elephant in the room or the box that's in the room. Deal with the problem that's there. Speak the truth in love. And to all of you, don't assume that your spouse knows what you're frustrated about. If you're walking around with a smile, we think you're happy. We believe your smile. Don't assume that your spouse understands what's going on inside. We don't know each other's desires or frustrations. Don't assume your spouse knows them. And, and ladies, just especially ladies, your husband, he really doesn't know. I know you think he does. He doesn't know. So ladies, invite him to a fight. Okay. <laughs> Woo! So excited. Here, since she's so excited, let me tell you something. What are we fighting for? We're fighting for a better marriage. That's what we're fighting for. Check it on the screen. I am not fighting against you. I'm fighting for us. That's what we want. So I want to give some ground rules for a, a good fight. So we know how to fight the right way. We're not talking about hurting each other. We're talking about a good fight. So the first ground rule I want to bring up today is that the goal of a good fight is reconciliation. You need to know the goal. You need to know why are we going to put this box on the table and have this discussion. Why are we going to do this? Uh, reconciliation means to unify. It means to come together. It means to... It means to that, that we have a, a unity over the situation, that we are bringing our lives, our thoughts, and we're coming to unity over it. We're not going to let a, a box, we're not going to let a sin, we're not going to let anything come between us. We're going to begin to work on it so that we can become closer together. Your aim in a good fight is a better marriage. You have to remember that. It's a better marriage. Don't forget why you're fighting. You're not fighting to hurt your spouse. Hurtful words hurt. You say mean things, they feel it that way. You're not trying to hurt your spouse. You're trying to help your marriage. Your desire is always to reconcile. Your desire isn't to come in to let off steam today. Like um, it's just been stewing and I'm just going to explode on you. Don't explode on your spouse. Go into your prayer closet and explode in there. And then come out with a little bit of peace to solve the problems. If you enter the fight to win the argument, you may win, but we always lose. You're not coming to win. You're coming for a better marriage. We're fighting for reconciliation. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 9.26, it says, Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. Like it would be crazy just to take off running with no goal in mind. Now, a lot of people like to run to exercise. I hate to run to exercise. Matter of fact, if you ever see me running in my neighborhood, call the police. Someone's chasing me. All right? I'm not running for exercise. That's not happening. You need a goal when you're running. Some of you like to run. You're running for something. Run. A good fight has to have an aim. You have to know why we're fighting. We're fighting in order to reconcile. We're fighting for us. We're not fighting against us. We don't fight like a boxer beating the air. What does that mean, like a boxer beating the air? Well, if you're in the ring with someone and you're just swinging at the air, that's not helping your cause. Listen, you want to help your cause. You want to fight for the right reason. And the right reasons fight for us to solve a problem, not against us. Can I get an amen? Fight me. A good fight. If you're single today, you're probably thinking, 
Man, this sounds hard. You're probably thinking, I'm good at being single. I'll leave it there. Understandable. Awesome. That's a joke, people. <laughs> Number two, a good fight sometimes involves repentance and forgiveness. Uh, and just scratch that word sometimes when you're taking notes. I just, it's, it's all the time. Someone's going to be having to repent and somebody's going to be having to forgive somewhere along the way. Uh, let me, let's put it this way. Do you know it's really hard to be wrong? It's hard to be wrong. You know what's harder? It's for your spouse to have to tell you you're wrong. Oh, I don't like that. Neither do you. Nobody likes it. But let me tell you what's the hardest. It's when you're wrong and your spouse lovingly tells you you're wrong. It's even harder that in your pride you fight back instead of repenting. I have a quick little phrase for you. If you're wrong, repent. It's that simple. If you're wrong, repent. Jody, right? You've had to do that, haven't you? All right, just making sure. It's really quiet on that. I know Jody has had to do it. Um, all of us. If you're wrong, repent. If you're wrong, repent. Do you know most fights should be really short? You know, most problems shouldn't last very long. It should be a, a household of grace and love and truth and, and that we can have kind of difficult conversations because we want our marriage to get better. We want our marriage to get stronger. We want to be closer. And so there's a little problem. And while it's a small box, small problem, we bring it. And when we bring the problem up and we say, hey, honey, this is something that's bothering me. The best thing to do is to think about that and go, you know what? I can see why you feel that way. I'm really sorry. Will you forgive me for that? The other side of that coin? Forgiveness. Awesome. Thank you. I forgive you. I love you. And we work on it. We move forward. A good fight involves repentance and forgiveness. Number three, a good fight is not an angry fight. Not an angry fight. Like... You don't have to slam doors, raise your voice, stomp around. You don't have to be mean. You don't have to use intimidation to be heard. A good fight shares your heart, but you don't have to say it in anger. Angry words damage your spouse for selfish gain. That's what you're doing. When you're angry and you're throwing it out there, you're not trying to solve a problem, you're trying to win a fight. And all you do is damage your spouse so you can get what you want. That'll never work. There is a way to be angry though without sinning. There is a way. Uh, anger in itself doesn't have to be sin. How you use that anger can be sin. Uh, let your anger focus on the problem and not on the person. So let that anger, that thing that's bothering you, Instead of aiming at the person, you say, this problem is making me angry and I want to solve it with you. I want to solve the problem. Like, let your anger be about your motivation. Like, I want to fix the problem. I'm motivated to fix the problem. I'm not here to bring it in intimidation. It's motivation, not intimidation. That's how you have a fight without anger in it. And just a couple quick things, that, just to help you not to have an angry fight. Uh, just a couple quick pointers if you're taking notes, you need to know this, that you need to choose your time and your place well. Like if you're gonna have this conversation, if you're gonna, let, you're gonna say, hey honey, fight me, uh, you need to pick the right time. Uh, I know in our household, if I say, honey, fight me about 9.30 at night, um, she's gonna be like, I'm going to bed, forget it. Um, and, and then she's gonna be mad and wake up in the morning and I'm in trouble. All right, so I understand that there's a better time. Pick your fights well. Pick your time well. Uh, I would suggest, no, I would absolutely never have your kids around when you have that conversation because uh, they don't need to know that. They don't need to know that. So um, you want to be sure that you solve it in an easy way to gather right time, right place. Um, use your words. Um, let, let's put it this way. Don't use your words to trigger a hostile environment. Like, don't use words that create a bigger, worse fight. You can do, you know how we do that? We say things like, well, 
You're never any good at that. Or you say something like, you're always this. Never and always. You know why it's a problem? Because no one's never or no one's always. We may be right now in this situation, but I'm not always. So if you tell me always, I'm going to fight back and go, I'm not always. I am right now, but I'm not always. I'm wrong at this, but I'm not always wrong. Because if you throw never and always, then we have to fight back and defend our turf. So never say that. Never say this. Never say, you are so much like your mom. You're just like your dad. Don't say that. Hey, don't roll your eyes and go, oh, whatever. Man, they're going to come back fast. They're going to hit you hard. You give them a whatever, they're going to show you whatever. <laughs> Don't say, I'm finished. You're not finished. You might need a break, but you're not finished. Your relationship's not over. You work at it. And listen, don't... Don't uh, bring up past problems. You want to take a fight from what should be a small box? You bring all the problems together at one time and throw it on them. You got a fight. Not a good fight either. So keep your fights current. Keep your box empty. And if you've let too much time pass, then you just missed your shot. Let it go. Because you bring the whole box with all the rocks, you're going to throw too many rocks and you're going to hurt each other too much. So, number four, a good fight listens before speaking. A good fight listens before speaking. The Bible says in James 1.19, My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone, who is everyone? Now that's me. That's all you need to say, that's me. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak. Most people are just the opposite of this. Most of us are fast to speak, slow to listen. Most of us are very defensive. When we say, hey, fight me, I have an issue, I want to talk about this, I want to work on this. Most of us go into defensive mode so fast that we, we stop listening and we start speaking and we don't solve the problem. I have a little phrase that will help you in a conversation with someone uh, when there's conflict. And so what you want to do in the middle of your conflict, you need to you know, give your opinion. This is what I think. This is about my perspective on the box. And this is the problem. And, and this is how I see it. This is what I think. And, and you know, I'm letting you know all about how I think. And then when you finish saying how you think, then you need to look at them and say this. Now, what do you think? Like you invite them to come and be a part of the conversation. That'll really help you to listen. Give your spouse room to talk. It's rude to dominate a conversation. Amen? Alright, fifth point. This is the easiest of all of them. So if you feel like you've been sweating a little bit, um, this is great. After the fight. A good fight makes up after the fight. What does that mean? It means when you're finished working out the problem, put a period on the problem, not a comma. In other words, it's over. And once we say it's over, it's over. We're not going to keep hashing this thing out. We're not going to keep talking about it. We put a period on it. Pray for each other. Hug it out. But put a period on it so that you don't carry that into the rest of your relationship. Your goal is to reconcile and put a period on it and make up. Amen, church? Amen. Hey, last point. I want my beautiful bride to come help me on this last point. I think it's important that you hear from her along the way in a good marriage series. Here, you can use this mic. All right, she got that one. She's got it. Um, it's just good for us to... You don't have to sit. I'm going to sit. Um, last week, I asked her to come up here, and then I talked the whole time. Uh, so, <laughs> we're not doing that today. Um, we, had to, we had to solve a little problem last week. <laughs> I'm 
kidding. Sort of. Um, so, babe, it's all yours. Yes, yeah, so he gave me point number six, which is a good fight is only possible in a strong covenant. Now, covenant is a strong word. If you know anything about covenant, God makes covenant with us. We make covenant with him. We make covenant with one another when we get married. We could talk a total year on just the issue of covenant. The word covenant means a binding agreement. And so there are just times that you may need to preemptively make a binding agreement. I'm going to give you a case in point. Tim said last week that um, our honeymoon phase of our wedding lasted about 30 days. That's not very long, is it? Oh, y'all are quiet. Y'all are thinking. I mean, some people, their honeymoon phase lasts for six months, eight months. It may even go into the whole first year, you know, before you really have something that really, not ours. Nope, not ours. How many of y'all are raised in homes that fought? Yeah, me too. All the feet, all the hands, me too. So in my family, when something came up and there was something that you needed to settle, you did it by fighting. I mean, you just fought. Like, we just got, went after it. Tim was raised in Ward and June Cleaver's house, just like <laughs> Leave It to Beaver. It was just like that. I'm not kidding. It was just like that. And I was around it as a child. We've, we've known each other since fifth grade. And I'm just telling you, it was like the most like utopian little place that you ever wanted to be. So that's what he was raised in. And I'm raised in the house where if you get mad, how many of you have ever slung a can of hairspray at somebody? <laughs> I have. Yep. What I didn't know, though, is that's what some of my trigger points were. And when we got married, um, one night after we got home from our honeymoon, we went to Tim's parents' house, and we came home with this giant box, like the size of a Volkswagen, full of all of Tim's stuff. Trophies, yearbooks, jerseys, old Dallas Cowboy paraphernalia. We even came home with this giant... Not old. Not old. It is, was old. Beautiful. <laughs> we came home, this giant poster of Bert and Ernie. So I was like, wow, where are we going to put that? <laughs> so every day, we, and we had, we had a two-bedroom, one-bath house, literally out in the country in the middle of nowhere, and that's a whole other story, literally in the middle of nowhere in the western part of North Carolina in the mountains. So we have this box, and it sits there, and about every other day, I go by the guest bedroom where the box is, and I, and I say to Tim, you need to empty that box and take that box away. Okay, remember, he's agreeable. He's agreeable. He's always agreeable, yes, yes, yes. I mean, he would never, like, say no. I mean, it would have been a fight from the outgo. So every few days, I would say, why is the box still here? The box is still in the guest bedroom. There's still a box. And y'all, I did not even know until I got married that a box would bother me. You know, I'd always lived at home. I'd been with my roommates. I'd, I'd, I had no idea that I was going to become this person, that this spatial deal mattered to me. But this box mattered. So one day, about 30 days after we got married, I walked by that bedroom, and I looked in there, and I was like, where is the hairspray can. I'm going to tell you, somebody is going down today. And it is not going to be me. You know what I'm saying? That was my day. I was like, I am, I, like, it is, like, I am done with this box right here. I wanted to set fire to it. I don't care what was in it. So I blew up, and then he blew up, and then I just went over to my little area in my closet where I kept all my stuff and I picked up my purse and my keys. I said, I'll see you later. This is not how I roll. I got my car and drove away. Tim from Ward and June Cleaver's house is sitting there going, like, what do I do? Like, did she just leave? Like, isn't that like below the belt, flag on the play? Like, there's something wrong. There's something terribly wrong. Well, in the meantime, I get to the end of our little road, and I stop at the stop sign, and I am sitting there thinking, where am I going to go? <laughs> like, there's nowhere for me to I mean, I could go back home, but I was like, I'm not going back home. I can't go to his parents' house because they're going to take his side because everybody always takes Tim's side because he's the good one. 
and that's fine with me, but it's true. He's always the agreeable one, but it's okay. I'm not bitter about it at all. <laughs> but so finally I turn my car around and I go back and I walk in and he's just sitting there. He's like, what are you doing? I said, well, I mean, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I just, I was leaving. He was like, you can't leave. Like, remember the whole, like, 30 days ago, we had this whole wedding. There were 600 people there. Do you remember all that? I was like, I know. He's like, you cannot leave. Like, that is, that is a foul on the play. So that night, we knelt by our bed. We prayed. We asked the Lord to us, specifically asked the Lord to forgive me. And um, we, we drew up some fight rules. And so that's what some of you need to do. You need to be preemptive. You need to have a plan before. Because let me tell you, conflict will come. Mine was a bit, that was a funny example today. A box is a funny example. Let me tell you something. There have been some things in our marriage not so funny. Heartbreaking. Not so funny. The box was funny. Now, now it's funny. Like one day, don't you want to write a book one day that's like, it was funny, like, it's, it's not funny yet, it's not funny yet, you know, like, there's a day when it becomes funny, but you have to preemptively know, and our binding agreement, our covenant was, we will not leave, we will not say divorce, we will not, we will not, and so that has been kind of a guiding post, an anchor for us all these years, there have been many other opportunities for both of us to have issues, but God has been so faithful in them, and um, yeah, so I think that's really all I had to so say. Good. Yep. So good. A good fight is only possible under a strong covenant, because we never give it's up. It's true, and so you know good. this, I realized today when I sat down out there, this is how much the box story meant. He actually used boxes as an example today. <laughs> I, was, I was, there like, was wow. a scar, there was a scar. So let me close today as we've talked about conflict. My goal isn't to produce a whole bunch of fights at home this week around the house. Uh, I, I really don't want you know, 50 of you to call me this week at church and go, uh, we need help solving all our problems. Um, I don't want you to go to lunch today and list out the 10 things that are wrong with your spouse. Uh, I'm asking you to please be smarter than that. That's not what I'm saying. Don't try to solve every problem this week. Do it the way Jesus deals with us. I'm so grateful that when I gave my life to Christ, that in such a loving way, He dealt with a few things, but just gently, one at a time, but full of grace and mercy. And that's how we want to do it with one another. We want to deal with it but with so much love and compassion so that we can solve it. I want to pray for marriages that are here. And, and then if you're here today and you've never had an opportunity to receive Jesus as your Savior, I want to pray for that as well. Let's bow our heads. Father, I pray for marriages that are here. We know that there are already conflicts that were here before they showed up today. And even in my conversation, I know it stirs some things that can be painful and even some memories that are, are hurtful. And so, God, we ask that you would just let your uh, grace sit on those things and they would not drive us to have more pain. But, Lord, we would be driven, though, to solve problems, to heal our marriages, to talk, to come to each other, to solve the little problems before they become bigger. So God, I speak over every marriage. I ask you to bless them, uh, strengthen them, strengthen our marriages, God, in Jesus' name. And for those that are here today that have come to church and, and you've never met Jesus as your Savior, I want to give you that opportunity today. The Bible teaches us that there is a conflict between us and God. And that conflict is called sin. It sits between us and God. And, and every person has sinned. Every person uh, has just gotten themselves in places they shouldn't be. We've said a lie. We've done things that, that are sinful. And that's the thing that separates us. The only way to be free from that is to ask for forgiveness from Jesus. And the Bible says that 
He is just to forgive us. He will always forgive us. And you can leave here today with all your sins forgiven and a new life, a, a new, just a, a brand new heart. The Bible says that Jesus will come and He will heal our hearts and we can have a relationship with the Lord. And so if that's you today, I want to pray. We're all going to pray this out loud together. Join me in this. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. He came to earth. He died for my sins. He rose from the grave. Jesus, would you forgive me of my sin? And I receive that forgiveness today. In Jesus' name, amen, church. Amen, church. I love you. God bless you.